He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame. Even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive. So put on the new man. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly. Greetings and thank you so much for tuning in to Living Strong. As uh, always, it's our joy and privilege to be able to come your way and bring the Word of God to you. We've been studying through the book of uh, Ephesians, Paul's letter uh, to the church at Ephesus, and we'll be just going through it verse by verse. On the telecast today, we begin with chapter 4 and uh, with verse 1. In Ephesians 4, 1, Paul writes, I'm reading verses 1, 2, and 3, I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So Paul reminds the people at Ephesus that he is a prisoner of the Lord, once again, referring to the fact that he's under Roman imprisonment. And then he is beseeching them. He is uh, making a, a solemn request out of the people uh, in the church at Ephesians, and he says, you know, I'm beseeching you that each of you would walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. So as a community of believers, we must understand that we've been collectively called by the Lord. And that's the meaning of the word church, ecclesia. Uh, it's a community of people who've been called out together for a purpose, who've been summoned together for a purpose. And so he says, I want you to walk worthy of that calling. Now, in the next two verses, he begins to describe how they ought to walk worthy of that calling. And, and, and he talks about several different characteristics or behavior traits uh, that we should maintain so that we can walk worthy of our calling. He talks about being, uh, walking in loneliness, that is, in humility or a humbleness of mind, humility of mind. He talks about gentleness. It's being gentle, not being harsh or rude. Uh, not imposing, not domineering. He talks about long-suffering or patient, be patient. He talks about bearing with one another in love. And then he talks about doing our best, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. So he says, you know, if we walk in this manner, then we are walking worthy of the call that God has put upon us as His people, as His church, as the called out ones. And then in verses 4 through 6, he enumerates seven reasons why we can all walk in this manner. He says in verse five, 4 through 6, he says, because, you know, he says, there is one body, one spirit, just as we are called, and one hope of our calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. So he mentions seven things. He says, you know, because we have, we are common uh, in these seven things, we can therefore walk worthy of our calling. We can walk in this way. We can walk with lowliness and gentleness, bearing with one another in love and being patient with each other and maintaining unity because we are common. We have all of these things in common. We, have, we are one body. We all belong to the same church. Sure, we may come from different backgrounds, different life experiences and so on, but we belong to one body. We all partake of the one Holy Spirit. The same Spirit of God is at work in all of us. We are called to the same purpose, one hope of our calling, one purpose, one reason why we are all here, one Lord, Jesus, one faith, one common faith in Him, one baptism. We've all been brought into uh, that one body of Christ through, through baptism. Of course, the Bible talks about three different baptisms, the baptism in water, the baptism in the Spirit, 
and the baptism in the body of Christ. So here Paul is talking about one baptism, meaning that we are all baptized into the body, the same body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. And it's one God and Father who is over all of us. So because we have all of this in common, let's lay aside our differences. Let's walk in this manner so that we can walk worthy of our calling. So having admonished the believers there at Ephesians in this very important aspect of learning to live together as a people, as a community, as, a, 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 as, as people who are called out to the same purpose, now he begins to talk about gifts and empowerings that the Lord has put in the church. So in verse 7, in Ephesians 4 and verse 7, he says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So to each one, that means every believer, every child of God, every person who's part of this community, every person who's part of the body, to each one, grace has been given or was given in proportion to the measure of Christ's gift. So uh, each one of us as believers have been given grace. And this grace is in proportion, how much of grace has been given is in proportion to the measure of Christ's gift to each one of us. So let's just talk a little bit about that. Now, what he's talking about here, what he's referring to, can be paralleled over in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, where Paul talks about our, the, the functions that each believer has in the body and the gifts and the calling, or what we call as believers' functions or believers' gifts. These are different from the gifts of the Holy Spirit referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. Here what he's talking about is our areas of grace or our functions of grace in the body. Each one of us have a specific function in the body, and God has given us grace for that function. That means uh, there is an empowering of God over your life to fulfill that function that he has for you in the body. And that grace that is upon your life to fulfill that function uh, is also in proportion to the gifts God has given you, the, 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 the abilities, uh, the, the, the capabilities that are in you to fulfill that function. So all of us have that. Now, we reference to different measures according to the measure of the gift, meaning the same gift can have different measures. For example, there can be many people who teach the Word, but there, there are different measures of that teaching gift. Some may teach at a certain level of influence and impact and depth, uh, and some others may be teaching at a much higher level of influence, impact, and depth in the Word of God and a greater grace and anointing on their lives. So it's the same gift, but there are different measures of that same gift. So what Paul is saying is each one of us, every one of us has grace and gift. And the grace is given in proportion to that gift. You know, God is not partial in any way, but according to the function he has for each one of us, he has graced us and gifted us. But keep in mind that as far as, the, as, far as God is concerned, we can grow in grace and we can also grow in our gifting. Uh, there is more grace available, as First Peter uh, chapter 5 says, there is more grace. You can have access to more grace on your life if you would like. Even in your gifting, you can grow in your gifting to higher levels. In fact, all of us start out in a low measure of gifting, and then as we are faithful in using that gift, and God begins to expand the influence, the impact, and the depth of that gift. So in the kingdom of God, remember, God rewards things like faithfulness, that you should be faithful in using the grace and the gift that's currently on your life, and faithfulness leads you to promotion. Secondly, in God's kingdom, stewardship. That means you're taking care of the grace and the gift that you do have, using it well, managing it well, and as a good steward, then God begins to promote you and give you more grace, more, um, and expands the gift, uh, learning to walk in submission and, and learning to use what you have to glorify God. So if we do these things, then what happens is we can grow in grace. We can grow in the measure of that gift. We all start out at a very basic level. But the fact is this, each one of us have been given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then in verses 8 through 10, Paul seems to sidetrack, talk about something different in connection to the endowment of grace and gifts that Christ has given to people in his body. He says in verses 8 through 10, therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, this, this, he ascended. What does it mean? 
but he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. So what is Paul saying? He's saying, you know, this release of grace and gifts took place after the Lord Jesus Christ ascended back into heaven. So, and then he begins to reflect or give a little bit of insight on what happened in Christ's death, burial, ascension, resurrection, and ascension. Because he's saying these gifts are, uh, that were released to people took place after he ascended into heaven. So on his journey from the cross to the throne, here's what happened. And Paul gives us a little insight. It says he descended in first into the lower parts of the earth. And then when he ascended, he took captivity captive. So what, is, what does all that mean? And I will, I will just very briefly summarize what we understand by these verses. And I'm not necessarily being hard and fast on this, but just for, for us to understand what Paul is trying to tell us here. So when Paul tells us that he descended, we know uh, as Jesus was on the cross and he spoke to one of the thieves around uh, next to him and he said, today you will be with me in paradise. What happened is up until the time of Christ's resurrection, Hades, hell or Hades, was in the lower parts of the earth and had two big compartments. One was paradise or Abraham's bosom and the other was hell, the compartment for those who would be eternally separated from God. And we know that from the story that Jesus gave of the rich man and Lazarus, how uh, the rich man and Lazarus both died and the rich man went to hell and Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom or paradise. And there was a great gulf between the two. And this, this was all in Hades. Now, when Jesus died, he descended into paradise, and the thief also went into paradise. Paradise at that time, prior to the ascension, was in the lower parts of the earth, also called as Abraham's bosom, in Hades. And so he descended into Hades. And then when he, and up until that time, all the Old Testament saints, those who had faith in Almighty God and who, were, who, who received righteousness by faith, they were held in Abraham's bosom in Hades. And when Jesus ascended, he took captivity captive. That means he took all of these saints, he took paradise with them, Abraham's bosom with him, and he ascended up into the heavens. And that's why when you come into the New Testament, whenever you read about paradise, you read about paradise not being in the lower parts of the earth, but you read about paradise being up in heaven. So Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12 how he was caught up to the third heavens into the paradise of God. That's 2 Corinthians 12 verses 1 to 14. And also Revelation 2 verse 7, you see how paradise is in, uh, in heaven or in the presence of God. So that's what happened. When Christ ascended, he took all of the Old Testament saints, he took them with him as he ascended up into heaven. And so this is what Paul refers to here. Uh, when he says he ascended up on high, he took captivity captive with him when he ascended. And he's actually quoting from Psalm 68 in this passage. And then in Ephesians 4 and verse 8, he says, and he gave gifts to men. So when Christ ascended, what did he do? He gave gifts to men. I want to bring your attention to the Greek word used there for men. You know, there, is, there are two Greek words that are used for men, that are translated men. One is a gender-neutral word, which generally refers to mankind or humankind. And then there is a very uh, gender-specific word for man, which is aner. But when Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 8, that he gave gifts to men, he uses the gender-neutral word referring to people, so that he gave gifts to people, not necessarily men as in the male, but men as in people, that is both male and female. For instance, that same word, anthropos, is used in Matthew 4.4 4, when Jesus says, man will not live by bread alone. When he says man will not live, he's not just referring to male, but he's referring to people. People will not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That's the word anthropos. And that same word is used in Ephesians 4.8 when Paul says that Christ gave gifts unto men. So the gifts he gave was not just to the ma male, but was to people, all people who belongs to his body. So with that in mind, let's go on and read verse 11. In verse 11, he talks about these gifts and he says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now, I want you to see the difference between verse 7 and verse 11. In Ephesians 4, 7, Paul says, to each one is given grace. 
according to the measure of the gift of Christ. That means all of us, every believer, has received grace and gift. But then in verse 11, he says, and to some he gave. So now this section of gifts or endowments are given to some, not to everybody. And he enumerates what those are. The apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist. These fivefold gifts or grace giftings are given to some as the Lord determines, as he chooses. It's given to both male and female. So both men and women, people, God's people, male and female, can be called or given these gifts of apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist. Now, this is in the church even today. Now, you know, uh, uh, some people may not believe in the function of the apostle and the prophet, uh, and they may just just limit themselves to the pastor, teacher, and evangelist. But actually, all five functions are in the church today. If we believe in the function of the evangelist and that of the pastor and that of the teacher, we should also believe in the function of the apostle and the prophet because these all are gifts that Jesus gives to people in his church, in the body. Now, when you look at church history, you find that the church did go through a time that we call as the Dark Ages, somewhere between 400 to 1480, when many of these functions ceased. They, they ceased to function simply because people had deviated and gone away from the Word of God. But beginning with the Reformation in the 1400s and on through the uh, centuries after, God restored the church. Uh, he restored truth to the church, first of all. And then after that, we see the restoration of these fivefold functions. So generally, those of us who, are, who, are, uh, who look at Pentecostal charismatic history of the church, we recognize the 1950s as the decade in which the function of the evangelist was restored to the church. That was a time great many evangelists appeared on the scene and began to hold big meetings and crusades and so on and with healing signs, wonders, and miracles. In the 1960s, we, we see that as a decade when, when the office of the teacher was restored to the church. The 1970s was the decade in which the office of the pastor was restored to the church. And then in the 1980s, that of the prophet, and then the 1990s, that of the apostle. So we are really in a time and a season in, the, in God's work in the church where these fivefold functions or giftings have been fully restored to the church, and there are men and women who are moving in one or more of these giftings, some people moving in more, uh, more than one of these giftings, and are serving the body of Christ. Now, what is the purpose of these fivefold giftings? We find that in verses verse verses 12 and 13, he says there, and he himself gave uh, some of these to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, verse 11, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunningness and craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body, for the edifying of of itself in love. So verses 12 through 16 describe the purpose of these fivefold gifts. He says these fivefold gifts are given for the equipping of the saints in order to build up God's people so that they can do the work of the ministry. It is the believers who are going to do the work of the ministry, but believers need to be equipped. So these fivefold gifts of apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist serve to equip the believers so that believers can be engaged in the work of the ministry. And they can, they can work towards the building up, the edifying of the body of Christ. And so that we can all come to the unity of the faith and on the knowledge of the Son of God. The one thing that will unite all of us is that we will all say the same thing about the Lord Jesus Christ, that we will have that common faith in, in Christ. Remember what Paul said at the very beginning of this chapter. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit, one body, 
And so that we come into that unity, recognizing that we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. And we all come to a mature man. That is, we come into the full measure of the stature of Christ. Because Jesus is coming back for a church that is fully mature, that is glorious, that is without spot or wrinkle, no defect, nothing lacking. So these fivefold gifts serve to build the church. And that is what is happening all around the world right now. That the church of Jesus Christ is being built up with revelation, with truth, with anointing. People are being equipped and raised up to come to the full measure of the stature of Christ. And then he says the body is going to function beautifully. Every member of the body is going to do their part. Every joint is in place. Every member is contributing. And the body of, of Christ is edifying itself in love. That's the kind of church we are moving towards. That's the kind of church Jesus Christ is coming back for. And that's where we are in God's calendar. Right now, what's happening all around the world is a fulfillment of this, these verses that the body of Christ is being built up and is bringing, being brought to that place of maturity and strength and full functioning where every believer will be doing their part and the body will be built up for the glory of God. Hi there, we're just delighted to introduce to you our free church app, it's the All People's Church Bangalore app. The home screen has a five minute a daily devotional, five powerful minutes of teaching from the Word of God every day. Uh, you can watch the video or listen to the audio. We also have a daily Bible reading and prayer guide. We call it Journeying Together, where we give you a portion of scripture to read and uh, points to pray about. And we journey together through the Word of God, entire Bible, uh, once every two years. We also have a sermon key point, which is a five minute summary of the Sunday sermon. So in five minutes, you get the key highlights of the sermon. We also have life group study guides that you use to study in your life group based on the Sunday sermon. The main highlight of our church app is what we call the toolkit, which has eight powerful sections filled with the word of God for you. We have a section called gospel with tools to help you share the gospel with your friends. We give you videos. We have a section called Reasons, where we provide answers for commonly asked questions that you might encounter. And people ask you, how do you know that God exists? How do you know that God created everything? Why do you believe Jesus Christ is unique? And so on. Questions that you need, that you will face, and there are answers there. We have a section called Faith Builders, where we list scriptures on various areas of the Christian life to help build your faith and make your declaration and act on the Word of God. We have a section called Identity, where we give you all the scriptures that you need to know to establish your personal identity of who you are in Christ. We firmly believe that who you are in Christ is who you really are. Uh, there's a section called on how to, where we give you instructions or guidelines on how to do various aspects of ministry. How do you minister healing? How do you minister deliverance? How do you lead somebody into the baptism of the Holy Spirit and several other areas that you would encounter in ministry? We have a section called group study guides, where we give you several guides to be used in small groups to study the Word of God together on various topics and themes, and this, this will keep on growing. We have a section called Principles, where we give you the Word of God to help you uh, make right choices and decisions as you encounter various scenarios in everyday life. And then we have a section called Lifestyle, uh, where it tells you the, what the Bible says on various issues that you may face in life. And so this toolkit is something that's really important that you'll keep coming back using almost on a day-to-day -day basis. In addition to Toolkit, we of course have all our sermons available to you, the audio, the video, the sermon notes, and the series. We have our TV programs available on the app so that you can watch it anywhere, on demand, anytime. We have our worship videos so that you can listen to uplifting worship music from our worship band. We have all our books available so you can read the books on your mobile device. And of course, we have the ability to connect to our services live from wherever you are in the world. So make sure you head out to the app or Google Play stores Search for All People's Church Bangalore. Download the app right away. Enjoy the journey. I'm sure it's going to be a great blessing to you. Before we close the program today, I'd just like to take a moment to pray with those of you who are watching. There could be some who are watching who, uh, who have never in their life made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ. You know, the Lord Jesus came preaching this message. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is here. You know, that's one thing we all need to do. We need to repent. That is, turn away from our own ways 
and surrender our lives to God and embrace His kingdom and become part of the kingdom of God. If you have never done that in your life, never made a decision to turn away from your own ways, your own life, hand your life over to Jesus Christ, the one who died for your sins, who was buried, who rose up again, who's waiting to be your Savior and Lord and welcome you into His kingdom. If you've never done that, I want to take a moment to pray with you. I want to lead you in a simple prayer so that you can make that decision today. And also right after that, I'm going to say a prayer. I'm going to pray for those who are watching who may have various needs in their lives. And I believe that if you will join with me in faith and agree with me, I believe God's power will touch you right where you are and God will release His healings and miracles and deliverances into your life. Uh, let's just take this time to pray together. If you want to make Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, would you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, I come to you. I repent of my own ways and I turn to you. I want to be part of your kingdom. I embrace you as my Lord and my Savior. Take my life and help me follow you the rest of my life. And I thank you, Jesus, for doing this. In Jesus' name, amen. And Father, right now I pray for every person watching. And in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I command healing to those who are sick. I rebuke every sickness, disease, and infirmity. And I command wholeness and healing to their body and their mind. I break off every work of the devil and I release the power of God to bring wholeness in their lives. And Father, I pray you'll release miracles, signs, wonders of God to meet their needs, to turn around situations, to resolve, Lord, dead situations and circumstances and things that are locked down. Change those things in their lives, Father, I pray. And I thank you for doing this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray the prayer with us today, you know, I want to encourage you to uh, first of all, start reading your Bible. Take some time to pray every day. And I'd encourage you to become part of a good church in your area. Be a faithful member of that church because all the things we talked about will happen in your life only when you're part of a local church community. Thank you for doing that. And until next time, remember, live life the Jesus way.